when you see the, the, guild the Navajo thing. Guild, you see the little half moon, the little moon faced right. stamp. And that was in the kind of the 48 ish. Uh, I think I think the uh, the guild was earlier. Uh, I can't remember, early 40s. Was it early 40s? Yeah, and, uh, I can't remember either. The Wingate Guild was rolled over to become the Navajo Guild. Uh, I don't know exactly when the moon was, uh, the horn moon was, uh, I can't remember yep. uh, when it was uh, first used. Got to use uh, your book. I got to use I use it too. You know, I, I do. I, yeah, I get well, to it and say, what the heck, I can't remember all this stuff. So I, <laughs> I go to it a, a lot. And I even cheat because I, I digitized my own copies, so I have it on my phone. <laughs> <laughs> I keep telling you, you got to do that for everybody. Yeah. For, Just I will. charge them. One of these days, yeah, I will. So, so we have this evolution of different guilds that go through, some federally done. Was the UATI also done with the federal government, or was that through? It's a, it was a bit of a mixed bag, I think, uh, if you look at the literature available in the, from the 40s in the National Archives, there was a, a lot of conflict between uh, UITA as an, as an organization and the uh, Indian Arts and Crafts Board. Uh, UITA thought the government's was, uh, requirements were too strict, mm -hmm. were hampering production, uh, and uh, the, the folks in the, in the government thought that uh, uh, it had to be a pure handmade product before they were allowed to stamp it mm -hmm. on. Uh, both kind of mellowed over after a while and realized they were both they were all working for the same goals, just right. slightly differently. Uh, and so uh, the UITA program, I thought, actually in retrospect was a pretty darn good one. But again, uh, not everyone belonged to it, and it was voluntary. You had to pay a fee to be able to li get licensed for the stamp. Right. But, uh, yeah, I've talked to some old trading post guys who yeah. said they didn't want to be a part of it yeah. for that and that they couldn't get the stuff all stamped and put them behind. Yeah, yeah. But uh, lots of people collect UITA stamped uh, jewelry, and I think it's great fun. Oh, I, yeah. I do too, yeah. And so uh, besides these different guilds that we see, and the Hopi Guild as well came in in the late 30s, I believe, um, what about stamping? The, the actual silversmith stamping. So that we start seeing this in the 30s, and by what time would you say most of the pieces were getting stamped or identified of some type? Well, I think the Hopis were pretty good at, at promoting stamping on their work, beginning uh, with the first uh, uh, classes in the late 40s. And yeah, that was there, right after the war, 46, yeah, when they 46 came back. 46 to 48, and, that's yeah. right. Mm -hmm. uh, and then... Uh, Kabodi and... Roan horse, I think, exactly, were involved yeah. in that. And, uh, and then, um, uh, but I would guess that, uh, that and, and I think the Navajo uh, Guild encouraged a lot of folks to sign their, their mm -hmm. work. But as best I can tell, it wasn't until uh, another decade or so before uh, uh, it became the thing to do, is to stamp your work, like mm -hmm. late 60s, early mm -hmm. 70s. And, uh, yeah, I guess you can, it has to be a broad period of time because I, I don't know if I can come up with a, an actual date, but mm -hmm. uh, certainly by the 70s and now, I would think most people do uh, mark their work. Yeah, I, I think so. And yeah. it's interesting that we'll still see a lot of things, I see a lot of things from the 60s, 70s, even 80s sometimes that just have no stamps. Yeah, it's 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 a bit of a, I mean, I, I personally think anybody who's in art should sign their work. Right. Uh, because buyers want to know who made this, uh, when did they make it, and, and by the way, how much is it worth. But, mm -hmm. but certainly who made it is important. And, uh, uh, and, and if I can editorialize this a bit here, I, I wish people in the art world would also go beyond marketing their work with just initials. Mm. Because there are so many people with the same initials. Yeah, how do you and deal with ease, that? They're easy to yeah. to copy, yeah. and uh, and I really get a kick out of people who uh, who takes who give some thought to it and take the extra time to uh, be creative with their hallmarks. It, it makes a big difference right. down the pipe. Big <laughs> difference, yeah. <laughs> and have you had silversmiths come up to use your books that maybe are just getting going and trying to figure out what they want to do for? Hallmark to look through it to make sure maybe they don't do the same thing. I they they don't say that, but yes, I believe it has happened. Yeah, yeah I yeah, would think. Yeah, it makes sense. Wanna, it does. Yeah, yeah. 
I mean, if you go look in the index of my books or in the cross-reference sections, look under, say, M, mm -hmm. or, uh, and, uh, and my, there are dozens of people in there signing M, and then you have to figure out, okay, what, kind, what style is this? And, right. And which is kind of fun, but... Uh, yeah, how do you do that research? How do you figure out dates of these, like Mary Morgan signed it this way and this way, and, and when they were active? Because it tells in their active silversmith, uh, if you know, at a certain time. How do you get that information? Well, uh, many different ways. I, I, I try to get, a, get into it. Uh, lots of other folks have done really fine work documenting mm -hmm. those, exactly those, those numbers, dates, uh, events, if you will, uh, transitions in people's lives. Mm -hmm. they, 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 Barton Wright, uh, for one, Pat and Kim Messier have done a wonderful job with their databases. And by the way, um, they've been so gracious in helping me. Mm -hmm. And it's people like that who who who, who, take, well, they, who 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 will come up with details and facts that they've uncovered. Right. And uh, if if you trust who you work with and you mm -hmm. it's it's good it's good data dealers say oh no i know so and so and he didn't start in, until then and no that's his hallmark from his early days and so just, dealers have been an important absolutely, aspect yeah, yeah. And dealers and traders and old folks and that, that work with the people exactly and they talk to them and they learn things and happily they're, they're so willing to pass on the, their information to me and I try to log it in as quickly as I get it. And, uh, right, before it's lost. I'm always working on the next edition. And yeah. do you get many families? Do you get to talk to many families of the silversmiths themselves? I Yes, I do, as a matter of fact. And uh, I have more time to do it now, and I really enjoy it. And I just, I regret that I cannot have, I don't have the flexibility in these big books to put as much information as I'd like to about each silversmith and their families. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure they because give you so much information. You add a line to every entry and, and 5,000 entries, and then all of a sudden there goes another 50 pages. And <laughs> you just don't have the luxury of doing that. Yeah, how that. big is the book now? This latest it's fourth copy. This is fourth 513 copy. or so pages, I think. Yeah. yeah. And I had to go to a, a larger format, so it's 8.5 by 11, so the spine doesn't crack when you... Yeah when you uh, use it. Uh, <laughs> well, we'll crack your spine. I can assure <laughs> you everybody gets one of your books. Oh, that's great. You know, well, it's important, I think, when we get things to look them up and try to give as much information as we can. And um, there's not a lot of references out there, quite frankly, to do it unless you happen to just know. And how, how can you know? It's like being a physician. You know, you can't know every you know disease entity. Yeah. You can know what you know, and then you better get, call in specialists. Yeah. So that's why yeah. I call in you on the hallmarks. Yeah. Well, I, I am, I am, I've been so fortunate I, I, to have, if without Barton Wright's original database, mm. uh, it would be very difficult to recreate what I've done now. I mean, very difficult. Mm. And then there are other uh, folks who, have, who think like me, uh, Pat and Kim Messier, who have done the same work quietly for years to mm -hmm. document uh, hallmarks and, and uh, information about silversmiths, uh, old dealers, and now... Uh, uh, silversmiths and designers are coming to me. Oh, great! Am I in the book? You know, yeah, I'm sure. here's my. Can I send you my marks? And I said, Oh, yeah, sure. And, and where can they send them if somebody has something? Well, they like can that. send it to me. Uh, care of uh, B Hogard at i i uh, uh, iCloud dot com is, mm -hmm. is one that uh, they can use. Uh, that would be great uh, if if they would. Yeah, buy his book. If you can't find it in it, then you can then you can <laughs> then, tell, then you can send it. <laughs> tell me what it is. And I'll put it in. Yeah, and I think that's important to people that might be listening, especially my some of the native listeners out there that go, okay, yeah, we know some stuff, because I think it's important as a just a history, if nothing else, and to get it right, to have that information handy and t for people to use it. They should be referencing it. I should probably be putting your name on every one from your book, because that's really m mostly where we get the information as far as um, active, when they were active and that kind of thing. Sometimes yeah. we know the silversmiths. Yeah. So. And I, 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 that's right, and I, and I worry uh, when uh, knowledgeable people like you and, and others in the business uh, aren't around anymore, frankly, uh, to, uh, to pass on knowledge. And I, I hope that everyone would document what they know somehow or another in this business and that's why we're doing give this. it to me or give it to somebody who's, uh, who can carry it on. Yeah, that's right. And that's exactly why yeah. we do this. 
for this very reason, this podcast and things like this, is so Super. that the, yeah, the information's out there and not lost. Have you had uh, what's your biggest surprise uh, uh, when you've done this over the years for Hallmarks? I guess it's acceptance. Um, when you when you put out books like this, that are just nothing but data points, mm -hmm. and they have to be right. And the Lord knows I made some mistakes that I carried on over the years, and you, you, you know I try to clean it up as mm -hmm. I go along. Uh, it's risky business personally mm -hmm. because you get attacked easily, and uh, uh, I've gotten a lot of praise. I've gotten attacked here and there, but but it's okay, you know. Where they say, "Oh, you don't know what you're doing." Oh dad. yeah, he missed this one, and look at well, what what a mess that is. But <laughs> uh, but I I try to clean it up over the years, and I think it's pretty good now. Yeah, and how many hallmarks do you have? Oh, I think I think there's over five thousand yeah. images in this one. Yeah, five thousand. So, yeah, and I've got it organized hopefully in such a way that it's user-friendly for people who want to look something up. Mm -hmm. But anyway, acceptance by people uh, in the business mm -hmm. and uh, people who make the jewelry uh, know who I am, many of them now, and, and kind of accept me, and which is uh, quite rewarding. Mark and Marnie, uh, Gady, they published a book on the Hopi photographs of Kate Corey. I think that was back in the 70s, I want to say, or the 80s, maybe. More like the 80s, yeah. I've seen that one. Yeah. And so she, how long did she live with the Hopi? Because she actually lived with them, right? Seven years. Yeah, so she thought. was there. Mm -hmm. I mean, just think Seven of, years. That's so amazing, right? She's a middle-aged single woman, I assume, an artist, a, a writer, um, a photographer, and she spends seven years at Hopi living with them. And... Um, Clearly, there was some kind of connection for both of them, or they wouldn't. She wouldn't have been able to do that. What was that all about? Do we know? No, clearly. Well, and she was also a painter. You know, oh, yeah, very, no, no. yeah, very much so. A really good one. A too. painter. Yeah. I mean, she's and in then, that 1913 Armory show, so she had some chops for sure. But how, yeah, definitely. How, yeah, how did that and, happen? And I mean, that's really an interesting story. It is. It is interesting. I think you know she 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 got there, and at the time there was uh, trachoma was mm -hmm. the eye yep, I disease know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. was uh, very prevalent, and so she had to. I think she had to move a couple times, you know. But they they got her a field matron's uh, government house first. I believe it was at the base, you know, of the mesas, and then a little while later. Um, she was able to then move up to the actual mesa tops, and she had, uh, you know, an adobe in in the village. Um, I want to say she was in, I think she was in Oribe. She was in maybe a couple different villages where she lived, Walpi. Um, again, there's photos of like her very first uh, house at at Hopi in the Border magazine, and and it's just she she must have really. Um, just found it to be such a, an amazing experience, you know, from her perspective of always living in the East. And suddenly she finds herself here in the West in a very remote location. And the photography, when you see it, you know, she definitely had a connection to the, to the people that she photographed because there is, and this has been written about, you know, the, the intimacy that you see there. And she even kept a Hopi English dictionary and a journal for about a year or two that really, you know, goes deep into, you know, her perspective of, of just the, the farmers, you know, them tending the crops, which she was seeing with the government. At one point, the government asked her to actually document um, disease that she saw and the living conditions. Um, so she was, you know, like many of the photographers, even Curtis, Edward Curtis, who I'm working on right now, you know, there was always the Bureau of Indian Affairs aspect um, that they, they had to check in with, you know, and report to. And I went through some of the early BIA letters uh, up, at, up at Keems Canyon that talked about, you know, le le allowing her permission to actually go with some of the Hopi people who are known basket weavers to California to an art exposition, mm. you know, very early on. So there was, I think the government 
involvement was and her teaching um she received a small stipend which you know she wasn't a wealthy woman uh so that allowed her to kind of live there and and paint and photograph and she was just i think a very remarkable remarkable uh singular human being that had a lot of um just depth and emotion to her. Caring. She was a very caring person. Do you know how long she lived at Hopi? How long were the years that she was there approximately? Well, she, she was there until 1912. And I do know that about 1911, 1910, she started to um, look toward, you know, she was starting to feel her age, I guess, and, and look toward moving back to uh, more of a town, mm -hmm. you know, that had probably like medical and Running and water. Um, running water, you know, I think she even mentions that. That's yeah. even that, that whole phrase, running water. And she she moved to uh, Prescott in 1912. But before she did, about 1910, 1911, she she went and found her her um, her lot in Prescott that she purchased. And some of the people from Hopi went there with her and started to help her build a Pueblo you know, revival style right, house, huh? which is yeah. still there today. Oh, that's cool. That's very cool. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to go see that. <laughs> I it's, it's now, I believe, a photographer's studio. Oh, yeah, I definitely have to go see it. Well, mm -hmm. I wonder if she, and I don't know this, maybe you do, but did she must have known Dixon. I mean, they had to cross paths. I haven't seen that, but she had to have because he was up in that area oh, as yeah. well. And, you know, they would have, she would have known about her. I mean, there's this white woman living in Hopi. I mean, that would, that would have been an unusual thing at that time. Yeah, it would have been. You know, I've been through all the archives at like MNA, uh, Museum of Northern Arizona, and the Smoke Eye, and Charlotte Hall, as well as Waukegan in Illinois. And I have not encountered anything about Dixon, which is very strange. Um, she did write about Nampeo. Mm -hmm. uh, she wrote about Edward Curtis and Frederick Monson, both coming there and doing some photography, just, just brief little sentences about mm -hmm. them. But I'm sure she would have known yeah, Dixon. He, yeah, Dixon knew old man Hall, actually. He met him in 1900 when he was staying with Ben Spear That's at the right. Mojave. And, you know, so he spent time. In fact, he, a lot of the things I think Dixon really kind of got his uh, groove on about what the West was, was through Hall because he had seen it. He had lived it. He really knew what the old West was. That's yeah. right. And Charlotte Hall, and she even wrote for the Land of Sunshine. That's right. Periodical, of course, which Dixon was very much involved with. Yep. And and so there, I'm sure there was that connection, you know, and, and Kate Corey. Well, you know, and I have to say, there's absolutely no doubt when I think again here that um, she, Kate Corey was involved in the, uh, like the early uh, exhibitions that they would have at the state fair mm -hmm. with, in Phoenix, which, you know, she would be judge and she would also enter pieces into that and the state fair was a very primary way for early Arizona artists especially the women to connect and show their work you know we have to think at this time there weren't the galleries and the museums right. that there are today we're talking the very early you know the teens right plus there was uh, probably uh, prejudice against women as well I bet showing oh yeah yeah definitely and Dixon was involved in that too even though he would come in from California and he would right. even take artists out on you know painting painting uh, excursions and and so and and I think I even ran across they even judged some shows together so oh that's interesting so uh, so we kind of took a uh, that was that was for me really guys anybody who's listening to this podcast that section I just wanted to learn more about Kate Corey because I find her so interesting and her paintings I've had only just a few they seem to be rare I don't know if that's really the case. Have you, uh, is there many out there of her work? There's not, there's not many paintings of hers at all out there. Um, you know, and, and I, ha I just have to say, I'm just so thrilled. <laughs> I can hardly stay on my chair, but I'm going to share this with you. We just recently, uh, we have been given the honor of receiving as a, as a major donation to our museum, Western Spirits, Scottsdale's Museum of the West, uh -huh. a collection of early Arizona women artists. Oh, wow. Uh, it's a phenomenal collection. Um, and a number of the pieces in the collection are by Kate Corey. Oh, that's so, 
<laughs> so, good. you know, we're, we're going to have a lot more to discuss and talk about and, and shows. Uh, Lillian Wilhelm Smith is one yeah. of the artists. Uh, so it's, it's a really rich uh, collection that I'm just so thrilled to share with you, Mark, that we're going to have. Oh, good. Is that coming in this year? Uh, it will be um, coming in next year. And, you know, it, we won't have it up right away, but uh, it's on the schedule, I believe. The first exhibition is scheduled for after our Edward Curtis show, and that's in 2021. Curtis is 2021 to 22, and then it will follow that in, in the late fall of 22. So I have a few uh, of those artists in my own collection, so of the early Arizona women artists. So we'll have to talk. <laughs> we will. <laughs> yeah. I'll actually, after over this, I'll send you some photos of some things because you might want to add them to your exhibit or who knows, maybe that's where their final resting home needs to be is with the Scottsdale Museum of the West. Yeah. So that's really interesting. That's exciting. Well, and I think that's an area you've had a lot of interest in, right? In women artists, you know, not just Arizona, but women artists of the West. Yeah. Maybe you could talk about a little bit about that because I know you've done lectures and different things and worked on that. So tell us about that, because that's an area that I believe is truly uh, has, to the most part, has been unsung as well and uh, shouldn't be. I mean, we have people like Edith Hamlin, too, is a fantastic artist. Did they have that? Did they have her work, by the way, in the in the collection? Do you know? There is. There is work by Edith Hamlin. Yeah. And yeah. and Marjorie Thomas. Yeah. And I have to say, you know, it, it's it's kind of like the universe is aligning for us in that regard because we're also getting next year a collection, a major collection of Marjorie Thomas's paintings and drawings. And oh, yeah. she was one of the first the uh, right. resident artists of Scottsdale. Yeah. And so merging that with this other collection, uh, we will, I mean, we're just going to be such a wonderful repository for researchers, scholars, um, our staff. Uh, people who want to learn more about the early women artists of, of the West, of Arizona in particular. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, and so are you planning any books or anything like that on, on this collection? I know it's a little early to be saying that, but... It, it, it's a little early. You know, I have I have my master's thesis on Corey, which was published in the Journal of Arizona History, but I would really like to um, further that on Corey and, and work on that as a publication, especially now with the Elliott collection. I think, you know, there's definitely going to be um, other publications that will come out of it. There's, I mean, there's so much like with the collection that we're getting, uh, things such as, um, you know, Zane Gray novels that were illustrated by Lillian Wilhelm Smith, right. yeah. the covers, yep. uh, puzzles, you know, that, 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 that she made. Um, we have China that was sold, of course, in Goldwater's department store. I mean, the connections again, Mark, as right. you know, just, right. <laughs> uh -huh. you know, so the China patterns like the Apache or the whirlwind design that Lillian Wilhelm Smith made, we've, we've got um, three sets of different China patterns, you know, so all of this is really important in telling the story of the West and what these women did and really you know, bringing to light their accomplishments and that they they were the, the early artists of Arizona that, um, you know, got us to where we are today and to like Scottsdale as being a center, you know, in the United States for for arts. So we yeah. can really tip our hat to, to these to these ladies. Now, you're, both your grandfather and your father used very good stones and coral. Mm -hmm. And when did they start doing that? Right off the bat? Uh, I, I don't know the history of coral before the mid-50s when my grandfather actually took a trip to Italy. His only time he went back to his home country mm -hmm. with my grandmother. They went, took a trip to and went to Torre del Greco and bought pounds of cut coral. Italian coral. cut Mediterranean coral that I still have a few pieces of, you know, what, 50 years later? Right, more. more. than 50 years later? Yeah, closer to So um, that's when coral really comes in. and that in also, the 50s. In the 50s. And that also, you know, a lot of guys, a lot of his employees went off to fight in the war. They came back and started working for him again. There was a, the economy was good, so there's a lot of jewelry produced in the 50s for those couple of reasons and mm. a lot more coral in our work. 
Yeah, because I guess I kind of think of that 50s stuff as being coral. A lot of the coral stuff, even early 60s, even mid-60s, I guess. Yeah, prior to that, I just I haven't really seen any pieces that I can ID as right. 40s or even 30s. In and fact, there are very few of those pieces that I've ever seen. Yeah, it's beautiful coral every time. It's just mm-hmm. like drop dead coral. Yeah, my dad took a trip, to, and he should probably tell these stories, took a trip back to Torre del Greco with the old invoices that my grandfather Per, you know, from that original purchase, and showed the guys who were running it right n- then, and they all laughed about how cheap it was, and right. You know, of course, now it's yeah out of sight. Well, and soon we won't have any coral. It's all and I have out. pledged to not purchase any more coral. I haven't pl- bought any coral in ten years. I, yeah, because it's you know it's just not ecologically yeah. possible. Well, acid rain and acidification of the oceans are. Yeah, there's no bleaching. coral in the Mediterranean yeah, that I know bleaching, of anyway. Bleaching it all out and killing it all. So we're, we're, it's, a, it's 30% of the bio, biome, I think, in the ocean is coral-related. So yeah. we have some issues. Yeah, and red coral seems to be with the slowest growing. Yeah, it can take forever. Yeah, yeah. And the, But they also use great things like number eight stone and Lone Mountain and different things, Bisbee and all they that. They had right? trays and trays of it. And did they recognize <laughs> early on that they needed to have the best of the best kind of turquoise or they just like the colors i think that that's just what was around yeah but in order to do the set work that my grandfather does you know with clusters of stones you need to have five times that amount to be able to pick a set out of it so that's why he just had tons of turquoise what was his favorite to use do you know i don't know I don't know. It seems like it's always high-grade stuff. You know, in my grandmother's collection of jewelry, I think he would probably put his favorite, and there is a lot of number eight in there. Yeah. Yeah, I know that. I mean, I even bought a bunch of number eight from you when you got rid of it a little bit. Yeah. I still have it. See, I'll use it when I want to get something made, and I'll bring it back to you. Great. Great. (laughs) And so by the mid-30s, you've designed your, you've done the repose work. You've got now your, mid, I mean, the, by your mid thirties. Oh yeah, okay. Yeah, not nineteen thirties, but, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Th- by your mid thirties, you're starting to do this, and then you get into some very more uh, contemporary modern designs yourself. Yeah, I oscillate. My work is very. I think it's very easy to see my grandfather and dad's influence. In yeah, me. they're absolutely my greatest influence, and then like Spratling and Jensen. And, I can see that. Um, so I get to go back and forth between. I do vine pieces and organic pieces and i also do very modern pieces i've combined those two things and i've taken uh, you know i went to the university and uh learned from michael croft different things that my family didn't ever use or Mm. even know about like what mokame and um basically that and i'd been a silversmith for 10 years by the time i went and took college courses and i've taken uh, workshops and stuff like that to to branch out farther mm-hmm. well you've taught silversmithing and too, i've right? taught for yeah. years forever right yeah you're a teacher <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> <laughs> and um do people come to you and go okay i want to uh do commissions or do they i mean we of course we represent you and we sell your work in our gallery um, but you also do like some special order kind of things, don't you? Uh, I did a lot as a younger man. To be honest, you're going to be getting my best work. I always, you know, if somebody comes to me and they want something that I don't do, right? Like, uh, you know, I want a, a animal hand carved animal. Well, I don't do that kind of work, and I don't even try any longer. As a younger man, I would have tried to accommodate, right? Because I wanted to explore that, or or we just needed the business, or this and that. But now, my I tell people that my the best use of me is to let me work, right? And that's what I bring to you. Yes, yes, yeah. We get some great stuff. I mean, and, we've had and some the minute somebody stuff. else gets involved in designing, I get cranky and. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's. I think that's true for any of the artists that we have. It's very difficult to. Um, when you start telling an artist what you need to do color wise or design wise, or I want to see this takes all, I think it takes the joy out of it for one thing. And, uh, and then the worst case scenario, it does, you don't like it. And if the client doesn't like it, then you're stuck with something you didn't want to do to begin with that you don't care. Yeah. What do you do with it? Yeah. You you know, tear it apart and start again, I guess. Just go with the stuff. Yeah. I'm able to do that. A painter's not really able to do that. Yeah. They scrape it usually. Or they just say, okay, this is brutal. 
you know. So most of my artists won't do commissions. There's a few that can do it, and I'm very careful about who I will uh, hmm. bring to somebody with, you know, if they have expectations of I want this horse and a, this barn and this, like, oh. Now, a craftsman will love to do that kind of work. Yeah. And I work with people like that. Right. But I don't do that kind of work myself, and it's probably exactly the way my grandfather felt, too. Mm-hmm. You know, have them make all these bezels for this hundred piece cluster of turquoise. You know, he's not going to sit there and make those. Why should he? Yeah. Well, it's not a good use of his time either. Right. And you want to do design. Mm-hmm. And do you have, do things come to you and go, okay, I have an idea that I want to try. Or is it you're making something and you go, I think I could do this differently. I've never tried this and do it this way. Are those yeah, both process? of those happen to me. And, and I just... You know, I'll see something that I have never seen before of my grandfather's. That'll mm. get me going. Or dad's. Mm-hmm. Like, I didn't even know they did that. That's amazing. I want to try that. But I want to make it my own. Right. I or would... a stone will inspire me. Mm. Or And is the shape of the stone more than the, the color that does? No, it'll be the color. Yeah. Yeah, the shape is sort of incidental. Interesting. Because I've often seen bracelets and things, not just maybe yours, but have an odd shape or something. It feels like to me that the smith has taken the, that stone and worked the design around the shape of mm-hmm. the stone mm-hmm. uh, because it's a great stone, but it was an odd shape. Have you done that kind of stuff? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And sometimes I impose the silver on the stone into the silver. Mm. You know, it's it just just depends. And you also work in gold. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Do you have a preference? I love 18 karat gold, and I love working with platinum. Just as a craftsman, those are really fun metals for me to work with. They're very much like silver in the way they move. Mm. And what's the difference between working in gold and platinum versus silver? Well, the stakes are a lot higher yeah. because of the price. Right. You know, it's ten time, easily 10 times more expensive to make these purchases. So I, you, I tend to get very, or people tend to get, craftsmen tend to get, much more conservative with those metals just because of the cost. Makes sense. So there's a lot of boring gold and platinum jewelry out there as far as I'm concerned. Now, I have these fantastic number eight stones that I wouldn't put in silver Mm -hmm. just because, you know, it's like putting a diamond in silver. It doesn't make any sense. Right. But I don't want to just make a, you know, a conservative piece around it. So... It's tough. It's a tough balance. I don't know if anybody else gets it or not, but I'm compelled to do these pieces. Yeah, I would think so. It's being an artist again. Right, and, right. You know, I mean, why do you do it anyway? I mean, you're exactly. Just, <laughs> yeah. I mean, if, it's not, if it doesn't compel you, uh, then it's, it's not going to get done. Yeah, and it's a job then. Right. You know, and there's probably other jobs that are be easier and make more money. I mean... <laughs> Right? I mean, it's hard yeah. to be a silversmith, right? I mean, oh, it's hard to be an artist. Yeah, I mean, yeah. You, you've it's been not been lucrative. Yeah, have you know? Your probably your grandfather may have done as well as anyone, just because of where he was located in time. And his wife, he had this yeah. team that he was working with. It wasn't him alone. My dad and I were never able to put that together ourselves <laughs> and have this kind of a duo. Right. You know, the, your best model is you're married to your best model. That's fantastic. Yeah. And she's bringing in clients, right? Yeah, she's she her compulsion is to bring in clients, right? Well, she wanted to live well, and she did. Have her she table. wanted to provide for her family. She yes. didn't want her family to go through what she went through. Yeah, and she not only is an orphan, but she goes through the depression. Oh yeah, and, and World then World War, War II. and yeah, you know, it was it that's was a motivator. Not, yeah, it was not easy times. Someone told me a long time ago, um, uh, they were asking me about a piece, and uh, it was one of my first pieces, and I had a real long story to go with it. And he said, you know, he said, you got to be careful about that. And I go, what's that mean? He goes, their story might be better than yours. You know, don't step on their story. (laughs) And I thought, you know, gosh, that was a good point. That was a good point. Because, uh, you know, that's what you're trying to do, is you're trying to chime in on on, on where they come from. I do have a question. You, one of the things that you have done that I think will be, uh, will live on for, for a long time, hopefully uh, for become an important part of American art history is your Bodmer Catlin series. 
that yeah, you did. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. a unique idea. Yeah, uh, yeah. And you executed it. And I'd like to hear a little bit more about it for those people who don't know about Bodner and Catlin. You know, these yeah, are yeah, these yeah. artists yeah. that came yeah, to America. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah it, let's see. I'm trying to remember when I did the first one. Uh, Bodner and Catlin uh, were were a couple of important characters in Western art that were not completely uh, hidden, but because of the movie business and that kind of stuff, people didn't think, didn't chime in with that. It, they were a little, a little bit early. And uh, they, uh, the Western art that developed from the Catlin and Bodmer, uh, I thought would be interesting because of the 18, early 1830s. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, now they become more stereotypical. We were talking Lewis and Clark. Lewis and Clark, 1804, uh, Bodmer Catlin, 1833, 1834. Um, uh, Bodmer is uh, a European. Uh, Catlin is a, a New Yorker. Uh, they, coincidentally, were both working at the same time. Uh, both had kind of the same mission. Bodmer was working for a, like an anthropologist. You know, uh, they didn't have cameras in those days, so he he brought his watercolors and documented these guys. Catlin uh, was interested in doing the like. Uh, this fellow Peel had created a, 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 a museum of curiosities uh, a, a, in New York. And he thought, well, yeah, that'd be kind of cool. I'll do that with, with the Native Americans. And I will bring back images of these guys. And, and, you know, I'll bring back some artifacts. And people will see where these guys have been and what they're doing. And, uh, that'll, and, and they're, they're not going to be there real, real soon, real quick. And I thought, gosh, you know, this is something that would be a very interesting thing to um, bring into my my world the problem that I had when I first thought of it though is, is that I had I'd only started sculpting and I thought uh, it sounds a little cheesy uh, using paintings even though they're portraits you know both of them weren't really uh, into the, the the beautiful gesture necessarily they were mostly interested in capturing these men that stood before them. And that was another thing that was pretty crazy about this is that they had had, these people had gone to Washington, you know, and, and had uh, their portraits done. But prior to that, nobody had gone out and painted them where they stood. So you're yeah. really get, getting an image of these guys, or who these guys really were. And I thought, I'd love to do sculptures of these portraits. And I thought, I'm gonna, I'll know when the time comes because I'll finally get to a place where someone's not going to assume that I'm plagiarizing someone else's art. And so by the time I started, I'd already had, an, I had a name for myself and I made a real strong point and to, to explain to everybody what I was doing, that these were portraits and I'm doing portraits of portraits. I'm not trying to take anything away, not trying to add anything. I just thought it'd be fun to flesh out these, these images at, in sculptures. And then I used not only their paintings, but I also used their records and uh, the documentation of what they're, what they're wearing. Part of what the stuff I have in my studio right now is our recreations of some of these guys. I had, a, I had Matatopas uh, hold our forebears, whole outfit made. And, uh, and they're, they're, uh, they're all right there in museums and they're, they're uh, documented. And uh, uh, I did it in three dimension. And I, so I did five Catlins and five Bodmers. I, I worked seven years on the project. I did my other art along with that. And, and um, it was a home run. People loved it. My collectors loved it. Um, the set sold out right away. And, uh, and people, people signed up for the whole sets. And as I finished them, they, they went to their new home. And, <laughs> and yeah. it was great. It was great. You know? And I had people say, yeah, you need to do that again. <laughs> I go, no, I can't do that again. That was, that was, that was it. That was the only the opportunity to do something like that. Did you know you had a home run when you finished your first one? Or no, not? no, 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 no. The first one, the first one I was with the Alterman gallery in Santa Fe. And I remember I took it into the gallery and, uh, he, and he, they, yeah, that's pretty cool. And like, what's the feedback? Yeah. 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 You know, I go, okay. Shoot. You know? And then, uh, uh, that same piece went into an auction without anybody knowing what it was or who it was or whatever. And, it, and the auction wasn't that great. And uh, 
I thought, well, okay, that's fine. But I'd already had some uh, people interested in the whole set, so I mean, I was pretty committed. And then it started building steam, and before I knew it, uh, it just took off. And uh, uh, you know, the, the value of the piece took off as well. I mean, it became a real, you know, real, real groundbreaker in terms of of something that is collectible. But I always, I always would remind people or explain to them how I viewed it. I viewed it as as a as something that's historic i thought of them as art of course but not as much as my other work i thought of it my my obligation was was to get a little bit on the tight side and you really create the detail to sh so i could really show what catlin and bodmer were really interested in showing at the time and uh most people don't you know they don't think like that they just liked them and that was you know and i and i was proud that, that i was able to to get the the gesture the way you know these they did look like real people i made sure that i understood how tall they were uh there's a uh, little spaniard was like my height you know five six and then you had big soldier who was like you know six eight you know <laughs> you know so you know i want them to be real people and uh and uh, that's what they got and i thought i'm doing it as i'm doing a service by by uh, uh not necessarily a service but i'm not i'm not there's nothing degrading about uh, fleshing out something that important. And then the, uh, another thing that happened that was really exciting to me is uh, we were out on a, uh, a museum tour with the National Sculpture Society and our, our um, guy that takes care of our books and stuff, our banker, so to speak, was along. And he was looking at a life-size I had done of forebears, or two crows it was, yeah. and. Uh, he says, you know, he says, uh, I have him. And I said, I don't think you do. I said, I know where they all went, and I don't, you don't have one of those. And he goes, no, I don't mean that. He says, I've got Catlin. And it turned out he was the president of, of uh, Green, uh, Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn. And Catlin is buried there. Mm -hmm. And so, so he said, you know, we got to talking. And he says, you know the story? And I says, yeah, I know. He had a, he had a problem with his in-laws, basically. Uh, his wife died fairly young, and his in-laws blamed him for partly because of her death. And uh, when he died, uh, it was already set out that he was going to be buried in the fa family plot. But they were still mad at him, and they stored his body for a year. And when they finally did bury him, uh, they didn't mark his grave. So here you got this circle of graves in, a, in, a, in the family plot of his wife's family and an unmarked grave. In 1964, there was an outfit called the uh, Friends of the Westerners put a stone on his grave. So that was Catlin Steele. So um, this guy says, why don't we give him a, fit, a fitting marker? What can we do? And I thought, well, you know, he met a guy called Black Moccasin. And uh, when a Black Moccasin uh, was you know, like over a hundred years old, so they, they reckoned at the time. He said, I was the second chief of the Hidatsas when Lewis and Clark came up the river. And he said, I was the first one to greet them when they came up and they landed. And I said, I'd like to do, I'd like to do Black Moccasin greeting Lewis and Clark. And we'll put it, on his, we'll put it at his gravesite. And that's what we did. And so, oh. so I've, got, I've got my sculpture there greeting people as they come into Catlin's grave. And th that, was, that was like one of the biggest honors I'd had. You know, and, you know it was to, to be part part of that and we when we had the unveiling we had catlin's descendants wow. you know, we had native americans we did it on his birthday so we had a birthday cake for him and it was we had a nice celebration you know it was a real fun real fun thing to do my project was about um native names and um and how um, Native people are so much a part of where they're from that it's also in our names. So I picked four different subjects and um, I researched their names. And so what I did was I put, um, I made a, a portrait, a clay portrait of the person, and I painted their Native name in paint, uh, a painting behind them. And I kind of merged them together by. Um, uh, by painting like what's on the painting on them as well. Mm -hmm. 
So I did my grandfather, of course. Um, his name is Gawala. And um, I did my aunt. Her name is uh, Noah. I'm sorry, Gawala Ba is my aunt's name. Uh, Gela Sheen is my grandpa's name. And then my cousin, his name is Ahoshi. And then my son, his name is Shiwia. And so I painted all their names and then talked about how our, um, our place, you know, how we live in our place and how uh, we're so connected to our place that um, uh, we name ourselves, uh, you know, with, with actual, like, uh, places that we live and where we plant or what we plant or what we wear, you know, all these different um, native names are actually so much a part of us. That they They're about part. the environment. They're about the land, the, the, the botany, the plants. They really relate mm -hmm. to the earth, really, right? Is that right? Yeah. yeah. And which is really appropriate for clay since yeah. it comes from the earth. So were these figurines or were they masks or what were they? They were full figures. Oh, yeah. They were uh, three-dimensional figures. And, um, and then the, the paintings, I actually used pigments from the places that I painted. So I, I, coll I collected some um, sand from, like Ohoshin's name is the structure by our red rocks. So I collected some of that red rock sand and I mixed it with the paint. Mm. And so it has that on there. And same with um, the other pieces too. I use actual earth from that place to make the painting. So and where was, are those sculptures? Um, one is at the Mayak Museum for my exhibit um, opening whenever that happens. <laughs> and then uh, one is at the SAR. And then um, one is here um, in the studio and the other one is in storage. There, I just have so much work that I do have to store. Primarily. Send me some images of those and we'll put them on the YouTube version of this. Oh yeah, of if course. Send those to me. And the one that's in Mayak, you said for your exhibit. What's that? What that? What is that exhibit? Um, I'm. I was. A, I was honored with the um, Living Treasure Treasures 2020 award. Yes. So, so that's another huge thing. Yeah, tell me um, about that. Yeah, that is a big deal. It's such a big deal. I can't believe it happened to me, and um, I'm just still thankful, even though it didn't happen. <laughs> It happened, but it didn't happen. Because nothing happened. <laughs> yeah, um, I think I'm Mateo so, Romero has had that, and Diego Rivera. Di Diego uh, Romero, both are living treasures too, right? Yeah, they're, they're the 2019 living yeah. treasure. And then, um, so I'm in the company of amazing artists, um, Tammy Garcia, Tony Abeda, uh Jody Naranjo, uh, Maria Samora, who else? Uh, uh, Uppy, Upton, Ethelbaugh, um, who else? Of course, Diego and Mateo. Oh, uh, Lonnie Bihal. Yeah. Um, well, anyways, amazing artists. Just over the top. I just had no, I, I, I am not worthy. <laughs> I just so what does that mean to be a living treasure, a New Mexico living treasure? What is that? Um, so the Maya chooses an artist to be um, not only their signature artist for their art market because they have this really big living tre um, native treasures art market that um, has grown over the years and has become very successful um, but um, it's just this I guess appreciation for a New Mexico artist that contributes to um, the art community mm -hmm. and so um, of course I I would have, if we didn't have a pandemic, I would have done numerous um, visits, talks. Um, I would, I have an exhibit going up um, in the museum. And my exhibit's quite large because I have done exhibits before. I have two solo exhibits and then I've been parts of other exhibits. So aside from my um, regular work, my um, clowns and sculptures, I do love to um, have some space to make something um, really cool in a museum. I don't always get the opportunity, but I just love and it. And these are I big, like. big objects, big ceramics that you're doing? So I have, um, I don't know how many pieces right now. I can't think of how many I have there. I've made three, I made three originals for their exhibit, but they have a, a farmer 
that is my height and his painting is just a little bit taller than him. So that's like five, five. And, and I'm, I imagine the paintings maybe five, five, eight. Mm -hmm. six foot. So that's the largest piece there. And, and then so is that I, a sculpture and a painting. Yes. yes. So that, so I did an exhibit called harvesting tradition. And this was about, um, how native people um, and people in general have kind of uh, digressed from original foods. Um, we don't um, hunt, we don't plant, we don't gather anymore. Right, um, McDonald's. We, yeah, so, um, so I did a, a lady walking sheep. Um, so it's a Navajo lady and she's walking into her painting and her, her sheep are walking away and you can see the, you know, the races. So that's a really fun one. Um, Sorraro cactus. I have a, a lady harvesting Sorraro cactus, and the sculpture is the a lady holding the stick and the uh, Sorraro. I, to I totally get it. So you have a ceramic image of her with the stick yeah. that then goes yes. into the painting behind yeah. her, which is a Sorraro. Yeah, that's really cool. And have you done much of that? Yes. I mean, and was that the? Well, there's What's that? Uh, the, that exhibit was eight pieces. And so they're all different splashes of different natives. I have a, a winnowing rice, um, walking sheep. Um, uh, oh, the corn beans and squash is the only one that doesn't have a painting. And I have these uh, ladies dancing social dance, um, uh, Iroquois social dance. And um, their garments are all painted in the corn beans and the squash. And, that and these are big figures too? These are big? These are very big pieces, yes. Um, and and how do you fire those? I mean, that's a that's the biggest deal, right? You've got to have a kiln big enough. Yeah, I have a large kiln, and then um, sometimes I'll I'll put a plastic at the hip at the belt or a, or the break of the pant, and then that way it pops off, and then I can glue it back together after I fire them both. And or if the piece is just small enough, I can stack two kilns on top of each other. Mm. So those are kind of the ways I deal with the extra large pieces. And have you been doing much of that size and that kind of sculptural work? Yeah, I have, um, uh, like I said, I have the two solo exhibits and they're all quite large pieces. And then, um, uh, let's see. Oh, I did the, for the uh, 100 years of federal policy and how it affected Pueblo people. I did a giant painting and then I did a giant grandpa and two urban grandkids. And he is taller than me, um, and they're and the grandpa's t pointing to the painting and talking about how we used to. Uh, it, it, the painting is a giant traditional calendar, you know, winter, spring, summer, and fall, mm -hmm. and it shows like all the different events, like planting, um, the plants growing, taking care of it, harvesting, and then the different dances that go in between, the home and the and the mountains. And so um, he's teaching his children, grandchildren, urban grandchildren. They have like uh, cute little tennies and like headphones and stuff. <laughs> Just a, I don't know, it's kind of funny. I mean, like some of my work is so unsellable and batty and just like, just like how do you, why do you put so much effort into this thing that, you know, people are just gonna see and walk away. But that's I, hard, I but that's hard. To do, yeah, I have That really to. is what it is. I mean, when you do those kind of things, for only art's sake. And the reality is there probably is a market. It may just not be the market you consider. It may be a contemporary market somewhere completely different in New York City or Chicago or LA it, or Tokyo. I'm definitely in, uh, I'm, I'm definitely in two realms. You know, I, the work I, I love to make and I, I don't get any money for and I have packed away. Oh my God, I have storage. I have packed storage of artwork and, um, and then the work that affords me the time to do this, you know, because if I didn't do well as an artist, a Pueblo potter, I wouldn't have the time to dedicate a half a year to making uh, mm -hmm. an exhibit or a whole year. My, my uh, celebrating Native legacies was a whole year. I was broker than broke and, you know, I just barely made it. Man, and I, I, that one had video. I had this really cool idea. Well, they gave me a really big space at the cultural center. So on one side of the exhibit, 
I had uh, five big sculptures of ladies singing, and then on behind them had a big screen, and their song on video would come on. Oh, wow. So we went here in the mountains, and I had these beautiful women um, dressed up, and they sang, and oh, it was just the funnest time of my life. I was pregnant as pregnant can be. And then um, on the other side of the exhibit is the Pima, the Akuma Atam women, and their sculpt, their portraits, um, I think there was six of them and one little girl. And then I went out to my mom's reservation and I filmed them and we had the best day. They came out and they sang their basket song. And, and then we went to my mom's house and it was so fun. They brought a giant um, uh, barrel and we oh. made chimith. I never made chimith. I've never seen it. They're, you know, those tortillas that are like. Right, right. those big ones, yeah. <laughs> and, it, it, and I cooked already, and they cook, They brought food, and we had this, this big feast with all these beautiful women, and everybody was still dressed from the, from the, vote, the video, so right. everybody looked beautiful, and those images are, are something I treasure. When I discovered someone who was a fantastic writer, it was like such an immense pleasure. Mm. You know, I just I just thought it was a noble profession. Yeah. But I knew that I could never write like Ray Bradbury, let's say, you know, or Dostoevsky certainly, mm -hmm. you know. But I, I could always make people laugh and I was I like making people laugh. And I was a very uh, this is gonna sound then like Brag Day show, but uh, I was very skilled at writing. It was like, it was very easy for me. Yeah. And well, that's... so I wanted to get better at it. Mm -hmm. And I knew that I could be a comedy writer, and that's what I always wanted to be. So, how did you approach that? So, you let you, I mean, if you're going to be a comedy writer, you got to be in LA, right? Yeah. So, you had to go to LA. I had to go to LA. I was living in Colorado, and uh, I didn't really like Colorado that much. And um, uh, Richard Lewis, who, you know, most of your audience may know, um, uh, was a very close friend of mine. We had met when we were 18, and um, and Richard started. In Arizona or, or uh, Ohio? Actually, uh, he was the roommate at Ohio State University of my best friend from mm. high school. And my best friend, his name is Kenny Weiss, who is unfortunately uh, deceased, but fantastic guy and very funny. He calls me up, he said, man, you gotta meet my roommate, because he's insane. You've never met anybody that's as eccentric and, uh, and neurotic as this guy. Yeah. And that's what Richard has made a career out of, is being neurotic. And that's real. Yeah. He is absolutely the most neurotic human being. Yeah, I don't think man. you can fake that stuff. No, you can't. Yeah, there's yeah. a little, you know, when you see those things come out like that, those are yeah. you know, real things. Yeah, but he's hilarious, and he's a brilliant joke writer. And most people... Was don't... he dressing in black at that time? Uh, you know, he was always dressing very stylishly. You know, Richard was, you know, a handsome young man, mm -hmm. and a lot of women really, really, you know, would see him and go, oh, my God, you know. And uh, But he was so nuts, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, But he always dressed well, you know. He, he had a sense of style, which obviously I don't have. But Yeah, well, uh, but, but this is video, so <laughs> the audience yeah. can make up their And own. I'm really well dressed right now yeah. for me. Yeah, you, know, no, you so. do look nice. It's a clean shirt. Oh, I like thank that. You. Yeah, better. Thank yeah, it's it excellent. is clean. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll enjoy seeing it tomorrow as well. <laughs> yeah. And so, and for those people who might not know Richard Lewis, he's on Curb Your Enthusiasm. Yeah. He's a longtime comedian, yeah, yeah. Uh, actor. Yeah. And, yeah. And one of your close friends. One of my very best friends in the world. Hilarious guy and, and a genius, really, at what he does. And so did he get you hooked up in He LA? totally helped me. He said, uh, listen, if you move to L.A., I will have you a job the very first day you're here. Wow. And I said, you know, Richard, I have a family. You know, that's like a big promise. And he said, I'm totally serious. And the first day I went to L.A., he called me up and he said, okay, go over to this address. And that address was Phyllis Diller's house. Oh, my goodness. And I started working that day, and I didn't stop for, you know, like 30 years. So. Wow. So you were at, so how old are you at that point? Because you um, say you have kids. Yeah. So somewhere uh, along the way, you yeah. may be married, but you definitely know, I'm really had bad on dates, and you keep asking me you, dates. You, you, you know, I did my birthday correctly, which I'm proud of. <laughs> After that, 47, I remember. Yeah, I was, uh, I don't know, 28, 29. 
So. Yeah, okay, so you go to L.A., yeah. you're 28, 29, yeah. and you knock on Phyllis Diller's door. Yeah, he's the nicest person I ever yeah, met Yeah, I've heard that, actually. She's the best. And she said, come on in. Well, what actually, in, what, in, actually, in. what actually happened was, a lot of people don't know this about Phyllis. Yeah. Phyllis was the first successful female, female stand-up. Yeah, that's right. I did because know that. Because Lucille Ball, for example, was a television star. She didn't do stand-up. Yep. Bob Hope discovered Phyllis Diller doing mm-hmm. stand-up. And Phyllis was also the first woman celebrity to champion cosmetic surgery. Yes, Long that's right. before Joan Rivers. That's true. So when I knocked on the door, this woman opened the door. I think it was a woman because this thing opened the door that was swathed in bandages. Oh. I couldn't see her face. She just had surgery. It wasn't Phyllis. It was a friend of Phyllis's. But oh. I didn't know who it was. Yeah, okay. And <clears throat> so this voice says, you must be Barry. And I said, yeah. <laughs> and uh, she says, oh, I'm not Phyllis. I'm one of Phyllis's friends. I just had a facelift and all of Phyllis's friends who have worked on, you know, recover here. Phyllis is in the garden and mm-hmm. she'll, she'll be in in five minutes. And then Phyllis came in and she was fantastic. I mean, the best. And, and did she kind of interview you for your humor to see? No, I was already hired. She'd seen my stuff. Yeah, okay. You know? So I was hired. It was just, you know, we just started talking and, you know, what subject she wanted me to write. And so stuff. would you be writing for her show? Because she had a show, right? The Phyllis Dilla show, didn't she have Yeah, a show? you know, at that time she was just doing stand-up. So you were writing stand-up for yeah, her, Yeah, basically. I wrote stand-up. That's mostly what I did. I was sort of like a hired gun for mm. jokes. And um, so <laughs> I did write for a, lot, for a lot of shows, mainly talk shows, um, but I wrote tons of stand-up for a lot of people who, unfortunately, most of them are gone. But like who it, else would you? Oh, my gosh. Would... I wrote for, you know, Bob Hope and Rodney and, you know, sort of a lot of great, you know, Jerry Lewis and, you know, Rickles. And, and so did you, oh, that's interesting. So did you have to find their voice and just kind of go, okay, I know this person's voice oh like, that's the job yeah right it's got it's not, it can't be in barry friedman's voice it's yeah. got to be in their voice and so. do you have to spend a little time with them or do you just go well and watch? most of these people you know i've grown up with yeah so, so i mean rickles know. is not hard just yeah. insult you insult yeah. you until you yeah, want to yeah. puke so, you know then. what people don't understand about the comedy business is that um you know they think everything's spontaneous and you know it's just out of the comedian's head in many cases it is i mean these people are brilliant mm-hmm. but once they've gone on television you know, years of material can be eaten up in two or three appearances. Sure. And then they all require writers because once they hit, everybody wants them on their show. And they've got to come up with new they've stuff. They've got to come up with new stuff. They can't tell the same story every time. And so do you see or hear old shows and go, oh, that's one of mine? Yeah, you know, but I really have a bad memory for jokes. But with Phyllis, um, after Phyllis passed away, um, someone put what they felt were the 30 best Phyllis Diller jokes Mm -hmm. on the internet. And a joke I had written was number two. Uh, And the joke was, Burt Reynolds asked me out. I was in his room at the time. (laughs) I don't really know if that was her second best joke That is brilliant, I will say. Uh, uh, It was a good joke for her. Yeah, Yeah. no, that was a perfect joke for her. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. She was really a wonderful woman. And the other thing that most people don't know about Phyllis was, she was literally a concert grade pianist. That I did not know. With orchestras all over the I world. I had no idea. But would rarely do it in the United States because it ruined her image. Uh, she had a Steinway grand piano that was just magnificent, you know, ebony, of course, mm-hmm. in her uh, living room. And there was an oil painting of Bob Hope on it because. Yeah, he helped you know, her. Yeah, he got her he going. Fun, and so did you ever sit around and listen to her play? Would she play? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. She was fantastic, you know. She was really an amazing person, really amazing. And, and every year until she died, you know, she sent me a Valentine's Day card and a Christmas card. Oh, it was so uh, sweet. Yeah. You she know? lived to be quite elderly, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so you do that as a writer and you're kind of, so you're making a name for yourself in the town, right? Well, you know, I was known in the, in, within the comedy community, but as a writer, you're always and this is an afterthought. You know, the public doesn't know you. Is this early 80s time frame? Kind oh of my thing? gosh, the dates again. Yeah, now uh, we got to fill this in. Yeah, like 70s, 80s. I'm trying to think. Uh, um, at, some, at some point, we're going to get into the Indian art world. Oh, yeah, yeah, too, yeah. But yeah. I want to fill it in until we get there. I think we'll yeah. make it. I'm well, not sure, know, but like I think we Like, I worked on a lot of, you know, the first talk show I worked on was this horrible show called The Will Schreiner Show. Uh-huh. And Will Schreiner is the brother of a soap act, 
soap uh, actor named Ken Schreiner, mm -hmm. and his father was a very, very famous comedian named Herb Schreiner, mm -hmm. and well inherited none of his wit. Mm. <laughs> and uh, but he was kind of pretty, so women watched him for a while. It was like a you know afternoon talk show, right? But it was hideous, right? And so you knew that he would butcher every joke that you wrote. So, you know, there, unfortunately, there's a lot of jobs like that because not everyone in Hollywood is as talented as one might hope. Yeah, so. well, and you've got to tell the joke. I mean, you write the jokes, but they still have to tell them and they have yeah. to do it in a form where it actually... Yeah, and you know, the people that are really good at it, it is an art form. Oh, big and time. And the people that are great at it are really remarkable. But it's, there's a lot of really sort of mediocre people, too, and they get famous as well. And you so know. you, at some point in time, you start, or you at least try to work for my friend, uh, Gary Shandling, right? Well, I met Gary. I never worked for Gary. I never had that pleasure. Yeah. Um, but I met him, and, you know, he was, you know, he was what everybody says, you know. I mean, you were his friend, and yeah. I just met him for five minutes. Yeah. So I can't really talk at length, you know. But he would be able my, to talk to you, I guarantee you, about who you are in five yeah, minutes. Yeah, well, Gary, Gary was, uh, you know, he was very straightforward and very nice and very professional. And uh, he basically said, listen, you know, I've heard great things about you. I don't have an opening right now, but I wanted to meet you. Wow. And, and was said, that well, for the for the Larry Sanders show or for the know, Gary Shandling show? I don't even remember. Show. I think it was the Gary Shandling yeah, show. Yeah, okay. You know, so that was kind of it. It was sort of a meet and greet. And that was yeah. it. You know? And so he said, I heard great things. I want to talk to you. Yeah. You know, which I thought was really nice because I respected his talent. And I, I, you know, I thought that I'd heard really good things about Gary yeah. personally. You know, besides his talent, I heard he was a really great guy. Yeah, he was a great writer. And, yeah. you know, he wrote all his jokes. I yeah. Mean, uh, he really, and the Larry Sanders show, of course, and the Gary Shandling show, both. But he, you know, not only wrote all those, uh, but, you know, he produced it, he directed it. I mean, he was everything. And it, really, I think the Larry Sanders show kind of just took him down in, in the sense of physically because it was such a demanding uh, show for him because he was a perfectionist. He wanted to be yeah, just well, you know, right. I, I didn't really know um, how much uh, Gary meant to the comedy community. No, it was but, amazing, yeah. You know, after his unfortunate passing, you know, when I was reading about all these people who, like, worshipped him and found him iconic, I was really kind of stunned because, you know, I didn't really travel in his circles. And so I didn't really know about, you know, all these things he had done and all these yep. people he had mentored. That and was his thing. He was, he was really, really a his complex, thing. you know, super interesting person. And it just made me, you know, sort of sad that, uh, you know, I didn't have the experience of knowing him better. Yeah, he was really what you saw. Uh, I mean, he was a very interesting, honest guy. He had his neuroses as well, um, but that's why he's in comedy exactly. as well. But he was a mentor, and he really did try to help young comics. He tried to help people that were doing movies and directing. He would give them an unbiased opinion. And um, the memorial, like you said, uh, that I went to was amazing. There was Everybody was there. Everybody yeah. who knew him. It was sort of a who's who of comedy. It was. And it yeah. was so, Kevin Nealon, Nealon was so amazing um, and with this kind of wrap up. You know, he was laughing and crying at the same time. And everybody yeah. else was too. And I know Gary would have been looking down going, yeah, okay. You got it. Thank you. That's enough. Yeah, I feel very yeah. jealous, quite frankly, that you were. His yeah. Friend. Well, we'll spend time. I on wanted time. to be his friend. Yeah. yeah. You know, he was very careful about that. Uh, he would let people in. <laughs> that there. explains why I wasn't his friend. He <laughs> so was very discerning. You did get to meet him, and yeah, he yeah. did. Uh, he and he get, said, "You know what? Five he, minutes with this guy was really enough. nice. Yeah, that was yeah, good. I, yeah. I enjoyed meeting Mary. I'm going to go on to better people now." Yeah. yeah.